Hello, everybody, and welcome to another installation of Where in the World. Uh, Thailand is our destination this week, and I'm going to be taking you through a PowerPoint presentation of uh, the Thailand tour that Sarah and I do together. So um, as soon as I can figure out the technology of uh, showing you my screen, we're going to get this going here. Let's try this. And I think that does it for us. So I'm going to plunge right in. Actually, I don't have that where I want it to be. OK, there's where I wanted to start. Um, before I jump in here, just a couple of disclaimers. First of all, pronunciation. The Thai language is a challenging one. And um, so I'm sure to get some of these pronunciations wrong, so uh, you'll forgive me for that. But if anybody wants to uh, let me know how to properly pronounce something, I'd be happy to hear about that after the fact. Um, also, um, if you have questions or comments you'd like to add while we're broadcasting here, um, that would be great. Uh, because I'm such a uh, technological um, non-savvy individual, to put it kindly. Um, I sometimes am unable to uh, access those questions in real time. So if I don't uh, respond to your questions and comments while we're rolling through Thailand here on PowerPoint, I will be very sure to go back and respond to all of your comments when I'm done. Uh, and one last, and that is that on all of imprint tours, any imprint tour that you might be interested in doing, um, nothing is required. So if I talk about something that we do on the tour that causes you some concern, um, feel free to ask your questions, right? Uh, you know, can I avoid eating shellfish? Can I, do I have to uh, participate in this and that or the other? Please feel free to go ahead with those sort of questions, but know that upfront, we can always make provisions for people to bow out of an experience or uh, something we're doing together that uh, you're not really comfortable with. Okay, uh, without further ado, let's jump in and uh, head off to Thailand. Uh, Thailand is, let me say up front, my favorite destination in all the world. It's got the, it's got the complete package. It's got World Heritage Sites. Um, oh, sorry, I thought we should quickly uh, uh, talk about the geography here. Um, uh, this is Thailand, and um, I like to think of it as a um, like a profile of an elephant's head. You see the, the trunk down there below, and the head reaches up with the big ear that flops back over there to Uda, Udon Rachatani. Um, and uh, it's kind of a helpful reference point for me as I go along, since I have no way to use a pointer on the screen for you. Um, if I want to try to identify something on another map, I can sort of use the reference. It's by the elephant's mouth. It's at the end of his trunk. It's up by where the eye would be. That'll help you zero in on uh, what I'm talking about. So going back to what I was saying, World Heritage Sites, beautiful non-Western architecture everywhere you turn. It's a Buddhist country. Uh, Buddhism is, is part of the warp and woof of their society, uh, which means to us as visitors, a welcoming, safe, uh, lovely country where everybody is friendly. Uh, Buddhism is a very live and let live kind of religion. Uh, absolutely spectacular natural wonders to be seen. Uh, some fun tourist kitsch, obviously. Uh, Angkor Wat, by the way, which is in next door Cambodia, but to me is, is an automatic adjunct to any trip to Thailand or truly to anything in Southeast Asia. Um, <clears throat> so even though it's an, an optional extension, um, I always think about it in terms of the Thailand tour. So I'm going to be talking about that as well. Angkor Wat is the mother of all Southeast Asian uh, site destinations. Um, great infrastructure. This is the brand new international airport terminal in Bangkok, right? Uh, uh, airports, roads, uh, um, transportation, you name it. The, those important infrastructure things that we need as tourists are our top drawer in Thailand. That makes everything um, much, much easier. And I love this photograph. My apologies to that poor Thai man who's using the urinal in the mirror 
But what I want to show you is this is the bathroom in that same international airport in Bangkok. And um, you go into the bathroom there while you're waiting for your bags to show up. And look, there's fresh orchids next to the sink. Fresh orchids. It's, and they're very fragrant. And, and what a superior solution to having some chemical uh, aerosol uh, uh, odor protectant, uh, you know, in, a, in a, an American airport. Here you walk in and it's your first moment in the country. And there you are with this gorgeous bundle of orchids uh, fresh in the bathroom. I mean, you know, what a country. I mean, that, that says so much to me about the experience of Thailand. And it happens when you first arrive. I mentioned this is a Buddhist country. I love this sort of stuff. This is Ronald McDonald, obviously outside of McDonald's. And what he's doing is, is called uh, the Y, W-A-I. And that's the, the traditional Thai slash Buddhist greeting. Um, you, you press your palms together. There's a slight indication of your head. Sorry, like, like, a, like the shadow of a bow. And uh, that is how you Greek people, sawadi ka, right? And sawadi krap, depending on whether you're male or female. Uh, I, I just love it. I, I right away lapse into that habit of whying to people when I see them for the first time. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's a saluting of the, the, the good in them, the spirit in them, as well as, as a very polite hello. So just a great part of Thai culture. I'm still on the subject of infrastructure here. Um, and that is, uh, uh, Thailand has great hotel accommodations. This is an old converted teak mansion that's just an inexpensive budget hotel. Um, I stayed here in 2008 and I think it was $20. Even today, I'm sure it's only 30. If you want air conditioning, 45 or 50 will get you a very nice business class hotel in Bangkok anywhere. Um, so uh, infrastructure wise, again, very affordable, everything's easy. The last thing, of course, the last pitch I want to make for an, for an imprint tour, a tour with Sarah uh, for Thailand is, of course, our absolutely wonderful local guide, our, our tour manager there, A. Pikul. If you've been tuning in this week to any of the other programs that Sarah has been hosting uh, on Where in the World Thailand, you'll have met A. already. You know she's a bubbly personality. She's a caretaker. She's really wonderful. It's been a great pleasure of mine to work with her over the years. And I don't mind saying we have a great time. She's just a delight. It's a total plus for the tour. Um, so just wanted to make that plug as we go on. Okay, ready for the tour itself. Um, the first stop is Chiang Mai in the north. Uh, and uh, the first actual, it's a great place to start the tour, right? It, it's not the hustle and bustle of of Bangkok. It's still, it's a city of two million people, but it doesn't feel like a big city. It feels like a good sized town. And the old part of town where we try to, uh, where we make sure we have our hotels, um, everything is close by. You can walk to everything. It's, uh, it's really a great place to start. And there's a big enough airport there that uh, getting your international flight, you probably will go through Bangkok, uh, but, but uh, either Bangkok or one of the big uh, gateway airports on, on the uh, Asian coast, uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, Taipei, uh, Narita in, in uh, Japan. Um, quite often there's a direct flight from those big hub airports uh, right into Chiang Mai. So no problem logistically getting there. It's much easier to get into the, to the city from the airport. You know, it's 15 minutes instead of 45 or 50 or an hour in bank for the big Bangkok International Airport. Great place to start the tour. And our first big site uh, experience on the tour is uh, Wat Doi Sutep. Uh, Doi Sutep is uh, Wat, by the way, is simply the Thai word for temple, right? So, so the temple complex of Doi Sutep is on a hill outside of Chiang Mai. It's actually quite a nice view back across the city. We head up there, and this is the main chetty in the center of the complex. A beautiful, you know, gilt gold chetty that you see there. But this experience is so much more than just the beautiful architecture of the temple complex. This is our first uh, opportunity to learn about Buddhism. A does a fabulous job introducing us to the, the concepts of the religion and, and how the temples are used. Wanted you to see here that the detail artwork is spectacular. 
here. Um, this is the series of temple drums, and this is part of the Buddhist ritual. Um, uh, mendicants come along, uh, supplicants come along, and, uh, and ring each of the bells. There's some spiritual significance to that. It's like any other religion and uh, the kind of uh, liturgy that helps to put your mind into that spiritual frame of, of thinking. Uh, the bells uh, add to that experience. Uh, it's, and by the way, one of the things I love about Thailand and, and the Buddhist, the, their version of Buddhism there, is that it's very inclusive. You always can feel like you can participate. So you could feel free to ring those bells, right? You don't have to feel like it's something that you maybe shouldn't do. One of the things that A does for us that I think really makes it uh, a great educational experience, but also really involves our tour members, is um, she brings out this book, I think it's called The Century Book, and uh, each person in the group will go up and tell her what their birthday is, not right down to the year that they were born. And she looks it up in the book, and then the book tells her what the, uh, the sacred Buddha posture is for that person, what their um, uh, color is and what their animal avatar is for. So you might have the uh, reclining Buddha as your Buddha posture, uh, the color of red, which you know has significance in the Buddhist uh, uh, cosmology, um, and then um, uh, what? The, and then the the avatar. You might be have born in the year of the rooster, the year of the rat, the year of the buffalo, um, and of course all these things are auspicious. And, um, you know, for the rest of the tour, everybody, you know, so, sort of goes around saying, yeah, I'm a rooster and yeah, I've got the, this Buddha posture. It's, it's just kind of a fun thing to connect with uh, the actual uh, religion of Buddhism there. There's many other, I'll call them stations at Doi Sutep. This is the little area where there are oil lamps burning and this monk has dipped a little oil to add to the flame so that the flames are eternal. This is sort of the, the uh, symbolic equivalent to lighting a candle in a Catholic church, right? And as I said before, extremely inclusive. This is one of our travelers who is participating, right? You don't have to ever feel like, uh, you don't have to ever ask yourself, is it okay? Is it okay for me to participate in this? Oh, and by the way, there's some of the Buddha postures there. And then there's an opportunity to uh, actually receive a, a blessing from a Buddhist monk. This is uh, a group of people who are, are kneeling and he's uh, got his little uh, sticks in his hand there. He's not beating people. Um, he's dipping that in holy water and, and giving them a little sprinkle of blessing. Um, the, the, the man in green right in the middle and the woman in red to his left are a couple um, from one of my tours that uh, we've done there. So they're in there getting that blessing. Here's, here's a person getting theirs as well. Um, you might notice in some of these pictures, now here's a good example. Uh, you see the, the fellow in the foreground right in the middle. He's got a little orange uh, string around his right wrist. That's part of the blessing that he has received from the monk. And uh, he'll wear that for uh, the rest of his time. And actually the the, the second man in blue just beyond him has one as well. That's part of that monk blessing. Now what's going on in this photograph is uh, we try to time our visit to Doi Sutep so that we're there when the monks have their chanting ceremony. So they're just about ready to start off, uh, off screen to the right and everybody's there with their cameras ready to take, to take pictures. And again, I have to say it one more time. You don't ever have to feel like a looky-loo there, right? This is, this is not considered intrusive. The monks are perfectly fine with it. Um, and so it's, it's just a, a great experience to have. By the way, notice the Thai girl in the, in the furthest foreground. She's whying, right? She has her, her hands together in that Y greeting. Um, and this is what's going on inside. The monks are assembling. They're starting to, uh, there's been a call to prayer. There's some prayers and then the chanting and whatnot. It's, it's a very powerful 
cultural connection experience, which of course is what we're always after on an imprint tour is to get, is to pull aside the veil of commercial tourism and really get our hands dirty in the culture. So this is one of those great experiences that we can, that we can plan, that we can schedule, that we can manage as a group. Um, that's one of the challenges is that genuine cultural connections very often need to be spontaneous, but this is one of those things we can plan and be sure of uh, to, to connect our travelers with the genuine Thai culture. Quite often we're there till the end of the day when it starts to get dark and of course they illuminate that beautiful golden chetty in the center of the complex. These are the uh, painted paper umbrellas of Bo Sang Village. Um, if you tuned in to, um, uh, oh gosh, I'm, I may be misspeaking here. I was thinking that, that uh, A had, uh, had, had done a virtual tour at Bo Sang Village, but that might not have been this week. Um, but uh, on, our, on our second full day in Chiang Mai, we have a day long excursion out into the countryside uh, it's, it's all about cultural connection. Um, but on our way to our final destination that day, a village, uh, we stop at Bosang. Bosang is a craft village where they do the uh, painted umbrellas, hats, fans, etc. And I know that uh, Sarah was talking about you can actually uh, have them paint on your, uh, your pocketbook, your pants, your blouse, your camera, your iPad, your uh, I, I think I had one of the local artists here paint a on a um, uh, iPhone cover for my daughter years ago. It's a it's a fun experience to stop and see this ancient handicraft still still uh, being practiced uh, there in Thailand. Some of the products here you can see they're just beautiful. Um, there's, there's a number of craft villages outside of Chiang Mai. You can actually spend a whole day if you want visiting them. This is the, uh, the silversmiths. And of course the MO here is they, they bring you in, they do a little five minute, 10 minute demonstration of their craft. And then of course they take you into the, to the sales room and try to sell you something. So that's just part of the experience. What we do at Imprint Tours, not being a shopping tour, um, what we do is, is focus on the educational side of that. I think the last few tours that we've done in Thailand, we've stopped at the lacquerware uh, village um, and sometimes the silk village. Those are two pretty fun, interesting handicraft stops. But what we're really uh, after on this day is to get out into the countryside and to visit a small Thai village. And the first thing we do upon arrival is we have a little bike ride out in the countryside. Um, this is one of those examples, right? If, you, if right away you're saying, I don't want to ride a bike or I can't ride a bike, notice that there's a vehicle there in the background. Now, you know, if, if anybody wants to participate but doesn't want to pedal, we can provide for you, okay? When we're out in the countryside, we visit a little co-op. This is a, a place where the locals are after they're done with their farming activities during the day. In the evening, they'll, they'll make some of these Thai handicrafts. And, and here's an opportunity to buy something, if you want, uh, directly from the people that are making it. And so that you know that the proceeds are going into the pockets of the people who really need it, not some big company or conglomerate or whatnot. Uh, and this is another thing that we try very hard to accommodate uh, on our tours is to make sure that the money that we're spending as tourists is, is going to benefit not some big corporation in London or Bangkok or Singapore, but, but that's going into the pockets of the locals and the, the people that most, uh, that most need that prosperity. Uh, we, we visit different things to, uh, depending on what's available, what time of year. Uh, on this little countryside bike ride. This is a mushroom farm. Those are uh, mushrooms being cultivated in those bottles in that little shed. Uh, and whatever we do, this is a great opportunity to connect with the locals. And you know, you don't have to be able to speak Thai. If you can just do a Y, if you can say hello, Sawadee Krab, and smile, even if you can't do either of those other two things, if you just smile, Thailand is known as the country of smiles. I know Sarah was talking about that with A earlier this week, if you tuned in. It really is true. Thai people seem to be happy, content, and it's, 
it's easy to get uh, a smile from a Thai person. So as I was saying, this, this countryside visit is a great example to rub elbows with everyday ties, not necessarily involved in the tourism industry uh, and, and make some genuine cultural connections. We wrap up the day with a traditional Northern can talk dinner, um, right? It's, it's traditionally eaten sit, sitting, sitting on the floor. As you can see, it's a different style of food. Um, by the way, everybody knows about Thai food in this country. Almost everybody loves Thai food in this country, but I want you to know that the variety of food and flavors is infinitely greater in Thailand than it is than, than what you can get in a Thai restaurant here in the United States. So um, food is something to really be uh, looked forward to. This was, again, just to repeat, a can talk dinner. Now, what's really special about this uh, particular thing that we do on tour is that um, we have the local, this is the local headmaster. He's just a jewel of a, of a fellow, doesn't speak a word of English, but you can communicate with whys and, and smiles and, and a couple of phrases. Um, he uh, is the local headmaster of the local village school, but he's also a musician and he has, you know, he has uh, his students come with him for the evening and they play Thai music for us while we're having dinner. It's not professional. <laughs> it's not, quite frankly, it's not even that good, but it's genuine. It's authentic. I, I, I love this experience. And of course, just like on our bicycle ride, this is an opportunity to actually talk to some of these kids. There's always an opportunity to engage them uh, directly, you know, after they perform for us, after we're done with dinner, um, they'll come and teach us to uh, play their instruments. They speak a little bit of English. You can engage them in that way. And then, of course, we wrap up the evening uh, with a little bit of Thai dance. Again, not professional, but genuinely authentic, which in my book is a much better experience for us. Uh, the, the evening is wrapped up with, as I said, with some Thai dance. And also then we do the, the, uh, uh, the lanterns, right? Uh, Chiang Mai is famous for its lantern festival every year where they send up hundreds of thousands of these. We just send a couple of them up in the air at the end of the night. And it's, it's really a great bonding experience for the group and a great cultural connection experience for Thailand. Um, when we're in, in Chiang Mai, we spend three nights there at the start of the tour. So there's plenty of free time. And of course, there's lots of other things to do that we haven't incorporated into the actual tour activities. Um, this is the, the annual Chiang Mai Flower Festival. We do our best to schedule the tour whenever we can to coincide with it. We can go and see their little uh, version of the Tournament of Roses parade. Um, but uh, uh, we can't always do that. Um, I think our next departure in 2022, that's January 16th with Sarah. Uh, January 16th, 2022 is our next one. And um, that one will not coincide with the Flower Festival because we have to avoid Chinese New Year, which of course is on the lunar calendar and moves around. Um, but anyway, uh, if it is going on, you know, there's all, we'll make sure that there's opportunity in the schedule to participate. It's, it's the pageantry of their traditions, um, a lot of fun things. Chiang Mai is also very famous as a shopping uh, destination. There's jewelry, there's those uh, Thai handicrafts that we've seen already. The night market is quite famous, not just foods, a little bit of everything. Uh, this woman is making mango and sticky rice. This is one of my favorite sweet treats in um, in Thailand, the, the rice, they put a little bit of coconut milk on it. And then of course those mangoes were ripening on a tree up until that morning. She's cutting it up fresh for you. It's, it's, it's a culinary delight. Another thing that's available in a couple of different places during the tour, but uh, very easily accomplished on Thailand, not something we organize, but something we'll help you with if you want to participate, is uh, the, the gathering of alms by the monks, right? It's early, early in the morning, you know, this is probably 5.30 or six o'clock in the morning. Uh, the monks go out and they walk around the town 
everybody knows what the route is and the locals come out and put food in the monks bowls and that's that's what the monks eat during the day uh, is is whatever food they are able to gather they're a mendicant uh, um, order meaning that they live off of the charity of others so and, and again you see both myself and um, the two Thai people that are there are whying out of deference uh, to the monk um, you're always supposed to try to keep your head lower than a monk's. Uh, and, and again, um, I, I can't stress this enough. I was absolutely welcome to participate in this. And as a matter of fact, the next monk who came along, I don't have pictures of him, uh, was from, had gone to school in Texas or something, and he engaged us and was delighted to have us participate. Here's another cultural experience that's available quite easily in Chiang Mai, and that's a Katoi Cabaret. These are Thai Katoi's or lady boys. Um, this is an accepted part of Thai culture. That's uh, uh, transsexuals, tra uh, transvestite. Sorry, no, I'm, I need to be clear. Transvestite. These are uh, these are boys that uh, love to dress up as as women and in these fancy costumes, and they'll have a, a, a lip sync show and. It's, it's really a fun evening of entertainment. Let me say again, nothing is required. This is an optional activity. We just organize people if they want to go. If, you, if this is too much for you, you don't have to, but it's pretty harmless. It's not anything sorted. It's part of Thai culture. Everybody who goes has a great time. Pretty much everybody who doesn't, when they hear about it, wishes they had. So uh, I, I'm going to recommend it. It's a pretty... Uh, pretty cool experience. It's it's just good, clean fun. Uh, also available in Chiang Mai, there's all kinds of sort of adventure sports sort of things. This is a, a ropes course outside. Uh, again, not something we do on the tour, just something available to you in your free time. And of course, because the tour starts there, you might want to go early. There's all these other things to do. Chiang Mai has quite a famous zoo. Uh, this this picture is just to show you that we are uh, we definitely will use local transportation during the tour. This is uh, uh, typical transportation in the back. They've just put a couple of bench sheets in there. Here's some of my tour members. And by the way, that's the attitude we want to have, right? This is fun. This is an adventure. This is uh, like you know traveling like a local. Um, if if you're someone who would be put off by something like this. I'll be honest, maybe imprint tours isn't the right way to go for you. Okay, leaving Chiang Mai, here's a map of uh, Northern Thailand up there. Again, this, this would be up by the elephant's eye to give you perspective of where it is. This is most of Thailand. The only thing that's been cut off here down at the bottom is the trunk. We're going from Chiang Mai, about a half day's drive in a, in a big luxury air conditioned coach down to Sukhothai. Sukhothai is our destination. Um, on the way, there's a number of things that we might still do. Uh, there's a couple of beautiful Lana temples. And what we've uh, done over the years is stop at one of the elephant, there's an elephant uh, conservation center there where they uh, care for abandoned elephants and orphans and whatnot. They have a little bit of an elephant show. Um, they, uh, we, can, we try to get there in time to see the elephants bathing in the river in the morning. And then they they put their elephants uh, through the paces. It's it's good, clean fun. It's a great way to connect with these uh, gentle beasts. There's my daughter when she was little, getting to feed an elephant a banana. Can you imagine a thrill for an eight or a nine year old to do that? Um, they're adorable. It's good fun. We used to have elephant rides, I'll be honest, uh, but of course in recent years uh, there's been a lot come to light that that's really not great for the elephants, so we no longer include that anymore, but we will definitely have some opportunity to, uh, at least in an, as an optional way, to uh, engage with the elephants. Uh, I said our destination was Sukhothai. Sukhothai is one of the two World Heritage Sites in Thailand proper. Uh, Sukhothai was the capital of what would become Siam later on uh, from the 13th to the 15th centuries, right? So, so uh, 500, 500 to seven, 800 years ago, this was the big power um, in what is today Thailand. I did, I did mention the word Siam. The, the nation was called Siam, excuse me, until the 20th century. 
when they took on the name of Thailand. Um, if, if you remember, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll, t I'll tell more about that later. Anyway, Suka, t I, I remember that uh, Sarah asked A on um, coffee chat earlier this week what her favorite place was, and A said she preferred Sukhothai over Ayutthaya, and I, I concur. I, uh, Sukhothai is just uh, elegant, beautiful. It's all ruins, obviously. Um, just very, very evocative and provocative. Uh, it's um, it's just beautiful there, and I love the way that it's a little bit more contained. Ayutthaya is quite spread out; uh, you can't really see everything on foot in a in a half day. Uh, uh, Sukhothai, you can see pretty much everything that's worth seeing uh, in a, in a morning. And uh, we do the bicycles here as well, but again, we can hire a, a tuk tuk for anybody who doesn't want to pedal. But just beautiful, beautiful monuments. They talk about the Sukhothai style. It's a, the, the, the face of the Sukhothai Buddhas uh, is, is very, very enigmatic and, and quite famous. There's a variety of styles because like I said, there was about 250, 300 years uh, of development here. This is one of our favorite stops. This is a Mondop, that's the name of that uh, that structure there, and this is a seated Buddha that's that's quite uh, quite often photographed. Uh, this shot right here, or version thereof, uh, appears on a lot of guidebooks and brochures and whatnot. Notice the gold on the hand; that's not uh, nail polish. Um, uh, one of the ways that one can make merit in Buddhism. I don't really understand the ins and outs of it, but you can. But rubbing gold leaf on a Buddha or on a monument is one of those things that makes merit. Uh, we'll talk more about that uh, in just a minute. This is another thing that that I can say is unique to imprint tours. We've got this great connection with this local woman in Sukhothai. After we've had our morning of sightseeing, she shows up with this absolutely delicious picnic for us, and we just sit down in a little pavilion surrounded by those those ruins that 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 uh, seated Buddha is is a 30 second walk from where we're having lunch and we have this lovely picnic again we get to engage the locals one year when I was there one sorry one year when I was there they had some special thing going on in the evening they had some fireworks and some uh, some colored lights it was quite spectacular and then of course we uh, stay in a beautiful resort in Sukhothai. Uh, it's close enough to um, actually walk, but we usually ride bikes, like I said, uh, and everybody has a good time relaxing in the pool with a cold beer um, after seeing the site. Also, this is the place where the tour will provide for everybody at least wants to have the classic Thai massage. Uh, we have the uh, folks right there at our resort uh, the tour will pay for anybody who wants one to have a Thai massage. Personally, I usually get one every other day or so. It's, you know, for eight or ten dollars, you can get an hour's worth of absolutely uh, relaxing massage. I love it. It's readily available everywhere, but it's not for everybody, right? But for anybody who wants to, at least one will be provide, provided by the tour. Okay, when we're ready to move on from Sukhothai. Um, we head south. This is our route. We take it. To, uh, we're still using a coach to transport um, down to Bangkok, and we spend three full days in Bangkok. Three full days. There's so much to see and do there. And um, the first thing we do upon our arrival in the afternoon, obviously, we get settled into our hotel. But then we have a Klong tour. Klong is just the Thai word for canal, and Bangkok has has actually been called the Venice of the East. It's a city that is laced with canals. Um, not so much Bangkok as Tomburi. Tomburi is that section of Bangkok that's on the other side of the Chao Phraya River uh, from all the other main monuments. Um, but it's, like I said, laced with canals. <clears throat> and having a tour in the long tail boats is probably the most genuine way to experience what I would call the watery soul of the of the capital, right? You you see everyday houses, 
temple complexes, kids playing soccer, schools, uh, you know, people doing all, all manner of, uh, of, of life on the water. Here's a little vendor. Looks like he's got some fruit there. Maybe he's headed to one of the floating markets. Here's a guy doing his, uh, uh, his dishes after dinner in one of the canals. You see beautiful teak mansions, cheek by jowl with uh, more uh, ramshackle type buildings. Uh, and, the, and the one site that we manage uh, during the Klong tour is the, uh, the Royal Barge Museum, right? These are the, the ceremonial barges of the Royal House. Uh, they've got them housed in this big warehouse. We stop, take a look here, some fun pictures. And then we have a, a, a lovely sort of uh, signature, uh, what am I searching for? Candlelit dinner uh, right next to the Chao Phraya River. And, and of course the great monuments of Bangkok are lit up on the other side of the river. It's a really great way, great introduction to Bangkok. Now, the big sites in Bangkok that of course we're gonna include on the tour, uh, start with, the Grand Palace. The Grand Palace, and more specifically, Wat Prakeo. Um, this, uh, this is from the late 18th century that this complex was built. This is the great Yaksha, uh, the, the uh, guardian uh, warrior spirits, uh, warrior spirits of the, uh, of the complex. Uh, Wat Prakeo and the Grand Palace Complex, like I said, built in the late 18th century. And the history here is that the great rivals of the Siamese were the Burmese. And in, um, I believe, 1779 or 1780, around in there, they sack and burn the then capital of Siam, which was Ayutthaya. And uh, the Thai people have to retreat um, a great leader emerges, a man by the name of Taksin, and he leads the people to the southeast, and he founds what will become uh, Bangkok. And then once, once security is uh, once again um, in place, they start to rebuild their ceremonial capital buildings, starting with Wat Prakeo and, and, as I said, the Grand Palace. So when they do that, I mean, by the way, look at these absolutely beautiful buildings that make up the complex. Gold chetties and bots, and temples. Um, but what I wanna call your attention to is the decorations here. They look rich and expensive, but it's actually uh, painted tile, glass and mirrors, right? These are relatively speaking, inexpensive uh, materials. The story is, Ayutthaya was all decorated in gold and jewels, but the Burmese had hauled that all away and burnt the rest to the ground. And so at the time that this new palace complex uh, is starting to be built in the late 18th century, uh, the, the Thai people, the Siamese people, uh, don't have those sort of re resources. So how creative is this though? Uh, I, I think the result is every bit as spectacular and yet, not so expensive. These are the uh, the warrior protectors of the various chetties. Just this is this is a spectacular day, right? Uh, starting off with Wat Prakeo, uh, the Garudas, right? One of the sacred uh, uh, steeds of one of the Hindu gods. Hindu Buddhism, uh, sort of uh, two branches from the same tree, similar pantheons of deities. Um, similar stories of good and evil. There is a, a huge wall that surrounds the, the Watt complex and the entire length of the interior of the wall is, is are these quite electric uh, murals, right? And the, the stories are from the Ramakian, which is the Thai version of the Ramayana, the great epic of good and evil of the Hindu religion. You know, this is just two shots of of literally scores of these, uh, like I said, just electric murals. They are constantly uh, refurbishing them, so they're always in beautiful shape. There's even a, a model of Angkor Wat here, right? In the uh, in the 19th century, uh, Angkor Wat had been in steep decline for for quite a while, and uh, the 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 kingdom of Siam 
controlled most of what is today Cambodia, which included Angkor Wat. And so Rama IV uh, builds this model in the late 19th century. By the way, Rama IV is the Yul Brenner character for those of you who grew up like I did watching The King and I, right? The uh, um, Mongut was his name. His title was Rama IV. That gives you a little frame of reference there. The signature, uh, not the signature building there is this this temple that houses the Emerald Buddha, right? There's there's a it's uh, Thailand's most sacred religious object, the Emerald Buddha. It's actually carved out of jade. Um, you can't photograph it, so I don't have a photograph for you, but it shows you that this is a place that it's going to be crowded, right? We we always do everything we can to mitigate, mitigate crowds and all of our tours, but there are times that things are so spectacular that everybody wants to see them and therefore it's crowded. So just wanted you to know that there's going to be crowds when we visit the Grand Palace. And uh, by the way, you have to take your shoes off to even go into the porch there. So Having shoes that you can slip in and out of easily are a handy thing when you go to Thailand because every temple requires that you take your shoes off. So that's that's happening quite a bit. When you leave the Wat Prakeo complex, there are still some beautiful buildings, few of which you can enter, um, but they're, they're beautiful to photograph. Spectacular details. Interesting statuary. And our next stop is next door Wat Po. Uh, Wat Po is the oldest Wat in the oldest temple complex uh, in Bangkok. It's also the, um, the home of, uh, of, of traditional Thai medicine. This is where uh, Thai, uh, this has got the most famous Thai massage school in all of uh, Thailand. And uh, you can see there, you've got these uh, mythical uh, warrior guardians at the gates, just like the Yakshis in, uh, in the Grand Palace. And Wat Po is the home of Thailand's biggest reclining Buddha. Uh, this is uh, an immense Buddha. Uh, and you can see that the bot in which it uh, uh, resides is barely big enough to contain it. So it's kind of tough to get uh, get the whole thing in the shot. <clears throat> Here you get a sense of scale. Like here's some people in the shot so that you can see that those feet are about 20 feet high and probably 30 feet long. The feet are beautifully inlaid with mother of pearl. And these are the, uh, I think it's 114 attributes of the Buddha. Um, Thailand is one of those great countries where the the big picture things, you know, like the reclining Buddha are spectacular, but the details are rich as well. Just giving you a second to look at this before I tell you what it is. This is the hair on the back of the Buddha's head. This is a great opportunity here in the, the house of the reclining Buddha for making merit. I mentioned this before, um, this is a crucial part of Buddhism, right? They believe in reincarnation. And in the course of your life, if you do more good things than bad, if you do lots of things to make merit for yourself, you move up the uh, reincarnation scale rather than the other direction. So Buddhist people are always looking for opportunities um, to make merit. And what I'm doing here is I'm paying 20 bots. And there's, you see those little dishes in the background. Um, it's a dish of coins. Um, and then you can go and drop a coin in each of these alms bowls, right? So the whole time that you're in this bot, uh, you, it, there's like this uh, little background music of the coins dropping into the bowls, chink, 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 chink. It's really kind of a Fun thing. Um, another way to make merit is to release animals from captivity. So this woman has her little cottage industry here where she's selling us for a little bit uh, this, this cage with the bird in it. And my daughter Maya will then release the bird. She'll make merit that way. And I'm quite sure that the birds are trained to come back and the lady will sell them again the next day, which I applaud that kind of entrepreneurial uh, spirit. 
Um, sorry, back to uh, Watt Po before we leave there. Watt Po is a real everyday workaday Watt. You know, Watt Prakeo that we were looking at previously, that's the showcase Watt with all the spectacular uh, architecture, statuary, uh, the Emerald Buddha, et cetera, et cetera. But Watt Po is a real working uh, temple complex. So there are lots of monks walking around. And of course, they would love to uh, engage you in, in conversation and practice their English. Uh, this picture is, this is a merchant who's selling, uh, you know, uh, paintings that she's done or whatnot. And I wanted to show it to you because Thailand is, the, the hassle factor is extremely low. As a matter of fact, I should say it's non-existent. Um, this woman politely came up and inquired if she could show us what she had. If A had said, no, thank you, she would have wide and moved on, right? It's, it's not that hassle factor that you get in a lot of developing world countries um, where they pester you to try to buy things. As it is, um, I'm looking at what she has. I'm buying a couple of them. One of them's hanging in my office, fun little souvenir uh, presented to me in a non-obtrusive way. One of the other things that we do in Bangkok is a tuk-tuk tour, right? It, this is a tuk-tuk, little three-wheeled motorized transport that's ubiquitous all over Southeast and Southern Asia. Tuk-tuk uh, just comes from the what they used to sound like, but you'll notice the CNG, clean natural gas on the little bumper there. This is one of those small things that we can do as a tour company is to insist that when we use the tuk-tuks, that we hire the ones that are not adding to Bangkok pollution. So we use the tuk-tuks to have a little uh, caravan tour around some of the sites that are not right in the center that we that we need to have transport to see. But rather than try to maneuver through Bangkok uh, traffic in a great big bus that's polluting, um, we want to have an experience that's more like what the locals would do. So here we are uh, with, with our little tuk-tuk tour. One year um, we were there and um, uh, <clears throat> we got caught in a traffic jam. Our guide pulled out her cell phone called um, called the police and they sent a motorcycle cop to uh, escort our group for the rest of uh, the morning. We had a personal escort. Just this, this is, I think, probably the best example of how in this Buddhist country, we as visitors are honored guests and not just in word, but also in deed. Um, this is the Ananta Semakom throne hall. This was built by Rama V. That's him on the horse. That's where he's buried. Um, and again, for you, um, the King and I fans, uh, the crown prince Chulalongkorn from the movie uh, will become uh, Rama the, the um, sorry, yeah, Rama V. Uh, so this is, this is early 20th century, and hence this throne hall that he builds. Uh, if, if you remember the story, uh, of course, the King and I is fictionalized, but it does give you a sense of how the Siamese court was uh, engaging Western influences and becoming influenced by the West. So that by the time Chulalongkorn becomes Rama V, he's quite enamored of the West and therefore he builds this throne hall with, you know, brings in a Western architecture. So it looks like a, a Capitol building or a church or something from the West. As a matter of fact, when you go inside, it's like going into a cathedral where there's mosaics in the cupola is up above your head, but it's scenes from the Rama, the, the Ramakian rather than the Old Testament. Um, we stop here and, and get a little photo up. Then um, Wat Saket, uh, the Golden Mount. This is on top of the, the tallest hill in Bangkok. Um, so there's great views, but around the base, there's all these little, um, little idols and little um, places where you can stop and worship. This is their version of the bells. Uh, you see the bells on the right there and the gong on the left. It's just like I was talking about uh, Doi Sutep back in Chiang Mai. Uh, and then up on, on the terrace, you get this great panoramic view uh, across the city. Big golden chetty that tops the Wat. And nearby is the, uh, the Iron Monastery or Wat. Ratana Dharam. I'm sure I'm butchering that conversation, but the, the nickname is the Iron the Iron Monastery. You can sort of see why it's got this metal roof with all these finials and, and spires. Quite impressive. 
this is another place that we visit what whenever we can you know uh basically we don't promise any specific itinerary on the tuk tuk tour traffic patterns uh, sort of influence where we go but when we can we go and visit what trimat here which is it's pretty um but we probably wouldn't go out of our way to see it because there's many 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 other more uh auspicious wats in bangkok and in thailand but this one is special because of what's inside this is the five and a half ton solid gold buddha this was um uh, discovered up in the north of Thailand. It was all covered by, um, by a, a clay shell, but lightning struck it and revealed the gold underneath. They cleaned it off. That sort of, of uh, divine intervention, if you will, gets a lot of uh, veneration in Thai Buddhism. And um, <clears throat> not to mention five and a half tons of solid gold makes this the most valuable religious uh, uh, icon in the world by far, you know, that's 11,000 pounds of gold. And you can see it's absolutely gorgeous. So if we can, we try to visit there. This is Wat Arun. Now Wat Arun is probably the third of the major sites in Bangkok, along with the Grand Palace and Wat Po. It's on the Tonburi side of the river. We've seen it on our Klong tour. We don't actually go to uh, Wat Arun, which means Temple of the Dawn, uh, but it is beautiful in the morning. Um, it's one of those things that we highly recommend that you go and do on your free time in Bangkok. But even if you never visit it, you know, just seeing it from afar uh, is really worthwhile. Um, the story of the decorations is quite interesting. Um, you know, there were mountains of uh, broken ceramics uh, from hundreds of years of trade with China where uh, broken ceramics ended up being the ballast in the trading ships and they would just dump them in piles. And so the Thai people who are, you know, we've already learned from what happened in the, at, the, at the Grand Palace are great at recycling materials. So you can see up close, the decorations of Wat Arun are actually just uh, broken tiles and broken ceramics. I like this shot. This is from up on Wat Arun, Wat Arun looking back across the Chao Phraya River, and you can see just to the left of center are the, the buildings of the Grand Palace on the other side. Um, free time in Bangkok, uh, uh, Koh San Road is walking distance from our hotel. Street food is excellent, and, and uh, Thailand is so clean and sanitary, you don't ever have to worry about uh, getting food on the sidewalk. Uh, the land of smiles, as I said before, it's a, it's, it, it really is a real thing there. This woman is selling vegetables and, and cooked fish on a stick. And do you have to worry about the fact that you can't speak English? No, look in the bottom uh, just below her in the picture. You see that little Casio calculator. So you point at a fish and she types in how much it costs. And you, and you think about it and you think, no, I don't want to pay that much. And you type in your price and you show it to her and she laughs and says no and she types in her counter offer and that's the way you bargain without having any common language whatsoever. Um, this woman, uh, by the way, creative, creative people, look at what she's doing with a cantaloupe. She's turning a cantaloupe into a piece of art and I think that's a watermelon in the bottom left hand corner that she's turned into a, a floral, uh, <laughs> uh, something to put in the middle of your table at Thanksgiving. Um, <clears throat> Bangkok shopping, I mean, Chiang Mai is a little more famous for this sort of thing, but of course, everything is available in Bangkok, the capital. Chattachak Weekend Market is a huge affair on outside of the, the city. I love the floating markets. Now, there's, there's a very, very famous market, uh, floating market outside uh, of the city called, I'm sure I'm going to mispronounce it, Daemnon Sadwak. But you don't even have to leave the city. This is Tailing Chan floating market, uh, which is right in Bangkok. It's uh, you know it's a, a 15 minute tuk tuk ride from our hotel, um, and you can go there on a free morning and uh, get some get some breakfast or get some lunch. Uh, very easy to do and very very photogenic. Okay, I've got a map up in here for you because I want to show you. You see Bangkok right there at the top of the the Bay of Thailand. 
And then just above that, you see C Ayutia. It's probably on my screen, it's a couple of inches. Ayutthaya is that former capital that I talked about. Just wanted you to see how close it is to Bangkok. Uh, most people who visit Ayutthaya um, go as a day trip from Bangkok. We go and spend a night because after about four o'clock in the afternoon, all the tourist crowds are gone. There's, there's some really good reasons for staying overnight there. And for those of you who are turning in and tuning in, maybe wanting to travel independently to Thailand, I do recommend this as a strategy. Spend a night in the Utia, you'll have a completely different experience. This is a, a, an old map. Uh, you can see that, that uh, the capital was built on a little island uh, for protective purposes. Um, so most of the sites there are on uh, this little island. These are the, a, a couple of uh, uh, stupas uh, at, at Wat Mahatat. This is uh, Wat Prasi Samphet. Uh, that line of three chetties is kind of a, a classic image of, of the site. These are more ruined Wats from Mahatat. You can see the Burmese didn't leave it in very good shape when they left in the late 18th century. This is probably the most famous single site uh, there at, at Ayutthaya. This is a, uh, the head of a Buddhist statue that, you know, that fell against a tree and then the roots of the tree actually engulf it as the tree grows. This phenomenon of religious symbol or icon meshing with nature is a powerful, powerful uh, event in, in Buddhism and, and a uh, source of veneration. So if I were to turn the camera around, I don't have a picture in here, but you would see dozens of Thai people, many of them taking pictures, but more of them kneeling, praying, uh, and they will add sashes to the tree, offerings on the ground here, a very, very important uh, element of Buddhism. Here are the, the Chetis of Si Semphet again. Uh, uh, other opportunities to make merit, right? Uh, the, the, the river that flows around the little island there is a place where you can buy fish, turtles, uh, other you know, lizards that are captive in their little plastic bags. You turn them loose and you make merit. There are a number of, uh, of watts outside of that, you know, that are not on the island, just nearby to Ayutthaya that are, are worthwhile. Um, look at the scale here. Look at the people up in the lap of the seated boot up there. You get to see that this is just this giant uh, gilt gold seated Buddha. Um, <clears throat> this is Wat Fanon Chong. It's a, a very popular Wat with Chinese visitors. This is my favorite because it's just a, a little different than any other Wats that you see around Thailand. Um, this is Wat Pukau Tong. Uh, and uh, the 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 um, the king that built this particular wat, this was his sacred animal, right? His sacred avatar. He was born in the year of the rooster. So this is what you see out front. This is the main cherry of Wat Chai Mongkol. This is along with uh, Kao Tong. Uh, well, maybe I even like this even better uh, because. Uh, it, it, there's always the saffron sashes on all the Buddhas here. And there's these rows and rows here. So at the, I, I always try to manipulate the day here with A so that we're arriving here at the end of the day because this is so photogenic here. All these uh, beautiful rows of Buddhas with their saffron sashes. This reclining Buddha is also uh, here at, uh, at uh, Chai Mongkol. Uh, also with his saffron sash. And you see that the people are, are engaging and making merit, but they've gone to the little booth that's just off screen here, bought a little bit of gold leaf and they're rubbing it onto the, somewhere onto the Buddha. Uh, at, the, at the foot, there will be people trying to put a coin. Uh, if they can get it to stick uh, somehow to the feet of the Buddha, that's another way to make merit. Now, I was making uh, a bit of a deal about spending the night in a Utia because they illuminate all the monuments. Uh, I, I had a group uh, back in, I want, I want to say 2013, that we had some pretty serious photographers. And so 
uh, we had a lot of fun on that particular tour, hiring tuk-tuks and, and going out in the evenings or er, early morning before breakfast to photograph in the best light. IUT is a place where you can get these beautiful night shots quite easily. The site is closed, but you know, it's this is not the United States. The, the, the caretakers, the guards, you know, if you give them a dollar and a half's worth of Thai bot, they'll let you go in and take a few photographs as long as you just spend five or 10 minutes and come back out again, no harm done. Uh, it's just one of those nice things about Thailand. Another thing that we do in the UTA that's absolutely unique is uh, we have lunch on a rice barge. Uh, we, it's a converted rice barge. Uh, this is something that you could never do on your own. You have to be on a tour, the tour group that can arrange this. A little bit of cheesy entertainment there, but just delightful to drift along. This is Wat, uh, uh, Rat, um, Wat, Watanaram. That's always a tough one for me to say. That's one that we, we don't have to visit because we know we're going to drift by while we have our lunch. Okay, I'm uh, running out of time, so I need to speed to the end a little bit here. When we leave Bangkok, we go south. We used to take the night train to go south, quite comfortable, but now we fly, so don't be worried about having to sleep on a train. We fly down south, and our goal is um, uh, um, Kausak National Park. This is a uh, Chalan Lake. It's an artificial lake. Uh, this, is, this is our sort of karst landscape experience. We, you see there, we stay in the Plen Pry raft house. I'm pointing out just by chance on the map there where we're located on the lake. You can see the lake on the map. And uh, we stay in a floating guest house. That's, that's where we stay in the background. Now, this is, these are photographs from 2008. I want you to know that everything has been upgraded. You're no longer staying in a little bamboo hut. They're, they're actually quite nice little bungalows now, raised beds. But you still do have to walk to a, a bathhouse at the end of the row, right? These don't have private facilities in them. It's, it's one night and the payout for your little comfort sacrifice is, is sleeping out on this lake, right? In the evening, there's absolutely no other sounds other than the sounds of the jungle surrounding you. And look at this spectacular landscape here. This, this little corner of the lake is called Little Guilin for obvious reasons. Quite often we see monkeys here, that's always fun. We have a little excursion in the afternoon, a little jungle hike. Then we all pile onto these bamboo rafts for just, just a short little trip across this little inlet. But isn't that fantastic? I mean, this is just stuff that's not available anywhere else. Um, I, I mentioned the little jungle hike, here's a flying lizard. Might, might see monkeys or langurs. And the destination here is this little cave. I mean, it's, it's not spectacular as caves go, but the, the, the feeling of it, the non-commercial feel of it is, uh, makes it a pretty fun little stop. For those who want to, we usually go out onto the lake for sunset. They're quite spectacular. And as I was saying before, I got ahead of myself a little bit. The nighttime is really special there. You sit out in front of your little bungalow, you have a beer with your friends. We've had a fabulous fresh seafood lunch, something right out of the lake. Um, delicious food and just absolutely quiet other than the sounds of the jungle. It's really beautiful. We continue on south to Trang province. We're now, we're down on the trunk of the elephant, if you will, so to give you a sense of where we are. Um, we head down to one of the islands in Trang province. And on the way, we, we stop at uh, Tan, Bokarani, Tan Bokarani National Park. Um, what we're doing there is, is paddling uh, into one of the Hongs. This is the, a phenomenon of the karst landscape there. Th these are all over this part of Thailand. And it's really a cool experience to, to paddle a kayak into these uh, it's it sort of feels like you're going into the maw of of Hades, you know. I mean, you can see how the Greeks might have come up with uh, ideas about the underworld when you see this sort of uh, watery cave. It's really a fun experience. We have a little lunch there. Head on further south, jump on a boat, and head out to one of the karst islands in uh, of Trang Province. 
Can't promise you that there's going to be a pier for you to uh, uh, on to uh, disembark with. Uh, you know, sometimes the we use the long tail boats to get out there, and we just have to drop anchor and jump in the water. So again, we're looking for intrepid travelers. If you if this is off putting for you, maybe imprint is not the best choice for you. But look at where we get to stay. I mean, we get to stay on Gilligan's Island. Uh, this is just a, a paradise. This is my favorite. We, we've ended up using three or four different resorts over the years. This is Thapwaran. Um, uh, this is my favorite because we stay in these little thatched bungalows, but they're very, very comfortable. Private facilities, air conditioning, uh, orchids on your bed when you arrive. We always have a, a great fresh seafood uh, buffet on the first night for dinner. We sit right on the beach. Look at that. Look at the view there. I mean, this is a place where you want to idle away some time. And of course, we make sure that there's a, a free day there. Again, I, I want to harken back to what I said before about Thai cuisine, so superior to what you get in a Thai restaurant at home. Where, where do you see a whole fish like this uh, on a plate in America? Of course, Americans are squeamish about fish with faces. That's another one of those flexible adjustments that you have to make traveling in Thailand. <laughs> but look at the rewards, look at the rewards. Apart from a, a free day for people to just relax on the beach or go find a swimming pool or do whatever they want. Um, we do have an, a snorkeling excursion pretty much all day long. We pile into the long tails, we head out. There's gorgeous islands all around, the beautiful karst topography, beaches, the highlight of our snorkeling day um, is the Morakot Cave. It's, it's really, really hard to give you an impression from these images, but that, that is a cave in the background of this uh, photograph. And it's the only way to enter this little lagoon. And I want you to, the, my, my waterproof camera didn't have a wide enough angle. I want you to, to complete this on the other side. You're looking up through a chimney to sort of a round circle of blue sky up above you. This is like uh, a little funnel down to this little beach and a little bit of sliver of jungle. And the only way, the only access is to swim uh, a couple hundred yards through the cave that's now in the background on the right of this photograph. You have to swim through the cave to get to this private little beach. Um, it's, it's just this spectacular little corner of the world. Here's some people emerging from the cave, not a very good picture, but it gives you a good idea. And I, and I you know, in 2013, when I took my first group here, we kind of had it to ourselves, but I'm sorry to say that it has been discovered and now uh, big tour boats from the mainland bring uh, groups of a hundred Thai people at a time uh, and, and like a giant floating centipede, they, they uh, put them in their fluorescent orange um, life jackets and they all come uh, swimming through the cave and it's not the private experience that it once was, but it's still magical. It's, it's still a magical experience. Okay, last leg of the tour, like I said, uh, to me, Angkor Wat is a, a, an adjunct to any Thailand tour. We fly back to Trang, sorry, back from Trang. People who um, are unable to spend an extra three days to see Angkor Wat uh, can just pop over to the international airport and fly home. The rest of us take a second flight to Siem Reap in Cambodia to see Angkor Wat, right? The, the, the largest religious building in the world. Uh, it's a microcosm of the, the um, Hindu Buddhist uh, universe, right? This, the, the, this prang in the middle of Angkor Wat represents Mount Meru, the sacred mountain. The, the water features around Angkor Wat represent the sea, the eternal seas out of which all life sprang. And it's, it's just a spectacular destination, Angkor Wat. Um, another one that uh, the first time I took a group in 2008, there was already a lot of people, but since then, popula popularity has exploded. By the way, the, 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 the two things that uh, put the Morakot Cave on the map and Angkor Wat, for Morakot Cave, they had an episode of The Bachelor that was filmed there. And ever since then, it's gotten really, really crowded. Angkor Wat was the 
Tomb Raider movie with Angelina Jolie about 20 years ago that put Angkor Wat on the map. You know, it's, we all want to see a place without crowds, but these places are so spectacular. How can we blame other people for wanting to share the experience? Great carved murals. These are the Apsaras, the heavenly maidens. And then for me, and I think for everybody else, one of the highlights here, you know, Angkor Wat is the, that one huge temple complex, but there are many, many other monasteries and temples. Um, this is to prom. To prom is, uh, sorry, I should back up and say, you know, Angkor Wat was lost from a Western perspective only. Of course, the locals in Cambodia knew it was there, but uh, Europeans discovered Angkor Wat in the 1830s. French archaeologists found it, and much of it was overrun by the jungle. And so they set about to restore the temples, but they chose deliberately, and I'm so glad they did, to leave a couple of them in the condition that they found. Look at these giant uh, ficus and uh, silk, cotton silk trees with their huge root systems that have, that have overtaken the, the monument there. This, this doorway here is prominently featured in the movie that I mentioned. Um, today, it's hard to get a picture without having 30 or 30 or 300 um, Japanese or Chinese tourists in the photograph because they like to be in their photographs rather than shots without. But look at this. I mean, th this is your, your metaphor for, for all the grandeur and all the works of man. Eventually, they're going to lose out to the powers of nature. Just, just spectacular. Um, Angkor Tom is another highlight. We spend three nights in Siem Reap, so we have two full days of sightseeing in the greater Archer, Ar Angkor archaeological zone. This is Angkor Tom, the very famous gates with the four Khmer faces uh, facing the four points of the uh, cardinal points of the compass. Uh, this is the Bayon. This is the uh, temple within Angkor Tom. I love it. This is the one with these enigmatic, you know, Khmer faces that I mentioned before from the gate. On the, on the towers here. Uh, you can see there's a little infrastructure there. You can actually climb around on these. Uh, pretty hard to get a photograph without people in it anymore because like I said, the explosion of popularity. Nearby is the, uh, te uh, the Terrace of the Lepers and the Terrace of the Kings. I call this the, uh, the uh, uh, Zumba Garuda line up here. See the elephants in the background there. And then this is Bante Shri. This is a, an earlier temple. Uh, Angkor Wat, by the way, the temple itself was built at the end of the 12th century. This is a couple hundred years earlier when the Khmer Empire, uh, which is around from the 10th to the 15th century, or at least in dominance, um, it, they're first just getting started. So, so these temples are much smaller. They're about a thousand years old. But what's spectacular there are the details, right? The details are really something at Bante Shri. So we definitely go um, out to Bante Shri, takes you quite far out. And on the way back, there's a temple we can climb, get some cold beers and uh, watch the sunset together. There's also a landmine museum uh, that we sometimes stop at. Um, <clears throat> uh, just, to, just to make that uh, long journey uh, a little bit easier. Uh, I know I've gone over time. I'm going to be done in less than two minutes here. Um, of course, while we're there in Siem Reap, we see a performance of Khmer dance, uh, always a, a beautiful dinner involved. There's always free time. There are other things to see. This is a place called Kabul Spayan, where they've carved uh, various things out of the, the rocks, the stones of the riverbank. Not part of the regular tour, but but like I said, plenty of free time always. And for a lot of people, after two weeks in Thailand and a couple of days at Angkor Wat, all you really want to do is just relax by the pool. So we make sure that there's always a gorgeous swimming pool wherever we stay. And of course, for those really ambitious travelers, on the last day of the tour, uh, before you head to the airport and uh, to fly home, your your pass for visiting Angkor Wat is good for three days, so you can head on out and see the classic sunrise behind Angkor Wat. Okay, 
Thanks to everybody for your patience for sticking with me. Um, I'm as soon as I'm done here, I will go and check. Uh, you know, once again, I was unable to monitor the questions and comments during the PowerPoint presentation, but I'll go in and answer anything that's come in. Thanks for tuning in all week this week on our Where in the World presentation of Thailand. Uh, we've got lots more coming in the weeks to come. So thanks for participating. And I will, I don't know if you can see me or not, but I'm whying to everybody and saying farewell.